Hello everybody, bienvenidos, welcome back to our radical sessions. Today we are connecting with Boston, we are connecting with New York, we are connecting with Madrid, incredibly, as we are in Madrid, but I am missing someone, I am missing someone, and I see, I see Andrés in a different place, so Andrés, please, welcome and can you tell us where are you? Hello, Alberto. Hello, everyone. I mean, in the in the anniversary, you were at Sahara. I was very jealous to be at the dojo presenting for an hour and you being at the beach. So now we switched. Now I came to Sahara and you're at the dojo. My my opportunity. I, I'm 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 really glad that you are in 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 Sahara at the Q Sahara enjoying that weather. So. So oh, perfect. So enjoying the weather and creating a lot. Imagine so, creating, that's nice. So what else can I say? Time flies. <laughs> I honestly cannot believe we're here at the last session of the first season of the Radical Sessions. It's been a very fun and interesting journey. This is one of our first initiatives born after the partnership with the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. And I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful for the participation, for everyone who's been connecting. I was checking earlier um, all the all the connections that we've had in all the three, four in, in the four episodes, and 98% of the people who connected to the first session connected to the other three. Also, the number of participants increased from session to session which is a good insight for us, which is something that we're really grateful for, that the content being streamed, if it's of interest, it's useful, and it's also fun to watch. That's also really important because connecting at 7 p.m. after a full day of work and, and watching an hour to learn, to understand new concepts, to ask like really potential questions is not easy, and you only do it if it's fun and interesting. And just for you to know, we're already working on the second season as Netflix. Um, even before the first season ends, they're already working on the second season, so we're doing the same. Uh, it's going to be completely redesigned, a complete new format full of insights, experiences inside the sessions, and as always, learning from innovation and entrepreneurship. I would like to thank again everyone who's been supporting us, especially our partners, of course, the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship Team, who's been really helpful, always there, always open for new uh, formats, for new talks, very, very, also making this very challenging, no, to get up to their standards, and especially the team who's been making this possible. I don't know if at the Cube they can turn the camera around because I want to show the people who's been working behind the radical sessions which are not few. Let me see. There you go. There you see the second camera. There you have Marco, Andres, our design, our head of design, Leti, our communications manager, Jorge from the Open Innovation team, Marco, our growth manager, Michelle over there, and there Alberto again. So nothing. I, I don't want to take much time from this really interesting session. I'm really thankful. We at, we at the Cube are really thankful for everyone who's been connecting and supporting this and these initiatives, and are really working on the on the second session. So it's all yours, Alberto. I, I'll be watching with a mojito. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Andres. Next time we switch, and probably next time Carly can be also in in Cadiz, in the south of Spain, and we can be in Boston. Let's see what happens. OK, exactly. So, or even we can all be there at the Cube Sahara if, sure. if the pandemic allows us. Sure, sure, sure. So first of all, as, as an icebreaker, I would like to, to tell you a couple of things. OK, so first of all, can you, well, I'm, I'm watching at the, at the chat and I'm happy that Pepe Minguez is already there, Fabiola, Miguel, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt, for supporting us from Boston and from the MIT. 
and the rest of people, for the rest of participants, can you put as an icebreaker your country and your company just just to to begin heating up our our chat? Okay. So for para los españoles, podéis ponernos en el chat eh, país y compañía. In vuestro caso, es es más fácil. Okay, nice. So the second thing, we are, I'm going to to leave uh, the chat in the hands of Carly, and I will present Carly later on. But once the chat is is um, is heating up, I would like I would like you to put all questions in the chat, so I can be collecting all these questions. Doesn't matter if questions are in Spanish. No pasa nada si las preguntas las hacéis en español, or you put it in English. So my languages are limited, so don't put it in any other language. I can read. I can read French, but the rest of languages, please go to DeepL or Google Translate. So put all your questions, and for the new, for the new ones, okay? For the new ones, as Andres was saying, 96% of people are are repeating with these sessions. But for the new ones, what is TRS? What are the radical sessions? Okay, we began with this partnership with the Martin Trust Center uh, some months ago. And we have been developing these very interesting chats, talking about entrepreneurship, talking about the startups, talking about innovation, and also talking about how corporations can profit from these new things, from things we create in this startup world. Okay, we are now in the last part of our first session in our in, in our session number four, and for this session, we said what's new within the new. And in order to talk about what's new in the new, we talk to Carly Chase. Okay, Carly, she is the managing director of the arm of startups in at MIT. We call we call this Delta Five. Okay, it's a startup factory with two two big places: one in Manhattan and the other one in Boston. So, so Carly will be moderating our panel. And our panelists are three entrepreneurs, three very brave entrepreneurs that um, that are going to to talk with Carly about different topics on new things, on how we see entrepreneurship in the other part of of the, of the ocean in the U.S. And I will I will let Carly introduce the um, our entrepreneurs just for you to see. That I will be here, Carly. I'm not going to interrupt you a lot. I will be in the last part of the in the last 20 minutes, just uh, provoking you a little bit with the things you are going to talk, and also trans transferring you all the questions that we will have in the in the chat. So I let you introduce the three participants, and. And guys, very glad that you are with us here at the Cube, and hoping that you can visit us personally in Madrid or in the south of Spain. Thanks, Alberto. I think I speak for all four of us when we say that's great. Um, Irene, as you guys will learn in a minute, is a little bit closer than Quentin, Sono, and I to, to I think achieving that goal. Um, but I'm really thrilled to be here, uh, and and thank you all to the panelists that are here today who are joining us. Um, I'm really excited after, I know we've been in these sessions together for the past few months, and I'm very excited that um, us at the Trust Center are gonna do minimal talking today, and, and you're gonna get to meet some of our fantastic alumni who are really in the trenches um, building their businesses every day. Um, and so let me just quickly introduce them so you have their background, and then we will get into questions. Um, so first, really excited to have Sonal Singh here, who is the co-founder and CEO of Spatiometrics, um, which is a spatial analytics company that is creating a future in which every building makes us healthier. Obviously an incredibly relevant topic today. Uh, prior to co-founding Spatiometrics, Sonal worked as a product manager in the wellness industry and took several data products to market, both at the consumer wellness software company, MyFitnessPal, which you might be familiar with, and in the payments industry. Her business experience includes negotiating data contracts with companies like Apple and working in the trenches across the product development life cycle. Of course, Sonal um, was a graduate of MIT Sloan and was part of our Delta V Accelerator program in 2019. 
Uh, next, Irene, and I should say Sonal's in Boston. Um, so joining us from Boston, as Alberto said, we have quite a few different um, ecosystems, rep ecosystems represented here today, which is exciting. Um, Irene Hernandez as the co-founder and CEO of Gattaca, which is a cybersecurity company on a mission to give users back control over their personal data through decentralized digital identity technology. Obviously, another incredibly relevant area, which I'm really excited to dig into and hopefully you all have lots of questions about. In addition to being an expert in blockchain-based enterprise solutions, um, she is a professor of blockchain applications at OBS and regularly speaks at international conferences. Uh, Irene started Gattaca, of course, right at MIT after conducting extensive research on decentralized architectures for identity and engineering energy, excuse me, financing systems while working at MIT's Media Lab. And before MIT, Irene spent a decade advising the US and European multinational corporations on IT strategy and is a global product architecture. Um, of course, she holds an MBA from I MIT as well and is in Madrid locally and graduated also from EO EOI in Spain, which I assume many of you are familiar with. Um, and last but not least, Quentin Coolin is the CEO and co-founder of Waffle, which went through both the Delta V incubator, uh, accelerator, excuse me, as well as a uh, accelerator here in New York, Barclays is Techstars, FinTech specific accelerator. Um, Waffle is a company dedicated to reinventing insurance and improving value for consumers. Um, it is backed by venture capitalists and and a lot of awesome investors, as Colin says. Um, Waffle is the first company that protects you, everyone, and everything you love through one fully customized policy. So I, we will definitely be diving into the personalization um, focus and, and insurance, which I find really fascinating. Um, prior to founding Waffle, uh, lawyer, uh, Quentin is a recovering lawyer, a human rights lawyer, and also a former speech writer at the UN. So incredibly global as well. And like me, New York is, um, sorry, Quentin is in New York today. So. Hopefully we'll have lots of questions about the great work they're doing, how they've been building their businesses, but also perhaps um, I know that there might be interest in learning about uh, all the local ecosystems that are represented on the call today. So, okay, enough of me talking. Um, I'd love for you guys each to, to introduce yourselves and give us a little bit um, more context on the businesses that you're building and also what inspired you to start it. They all obviously started at MIT, right at the Trust Center. Um, went through Delta V, but I'd love to hear a little bit more of the inspiration and perhaps that's changed over time too, if you want to share. Um, so I don't know if you want to get started. Yeah, sure. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Um, I actually started abroad at Asale years ago, but loved my experience there. So it's nice to be virtually back in Spain. Um, yeah, uh, a little bit about me. You know, I um, really had launched data products across industries and loved Love the aspect of data, love how complex it could be, but quite frankly, how powerful it could be. Um, and also love the aspect of just taking things to market, you know, figuring everything out on, on paper, but then also building it, but then also how do you tell people about it? So that entire, I kind of fell in love with that entire go to market cycle, if you will. Um, and so really kind of wanted to take that experience uh, when I first got started, as Carly mentioned, in the payments industry um, and apply that to, to health and wellness, which has always been a personal passion of mine. And so was really kind of focused on when I was at MyFitnessPal at the power of data feedback loops and realized like, wow, we're pretty good at giving people data feedback loops for things like fitness or nutrition or things that we have a lot of data on. Um, for example, if you tell MyFitnessPal, you know, hey, I ate an apple today, my fitness pal knows a lot about an apple and can give you that information back in a very democratized way. Um, but what I realized while I was uh, at MIT is that we were really good at those kind of things that we know and we have a lot of data about. We're really not good at providing data feedback loops for the social determinants of health. Um, and there's a couple of factors that go into that. I think the first is um, the social determinants of health that are a fairly new concept. We didn't know how, how strong and how powerful they were until very recently and of course, um, real estate and the built environment and the buildings that we're all living and working and connecting remotely in today are extremely important in that factor. And the second was that we were really bad at quantifying qualitative things. So again, it's really easy to quantify something like calories or number uh, number of minutes run, um, but we really didn't have a sense of how do you quantify daylight? How do you quantify privacy? How do you quantify collaboration? And so. The good news is that in the last five or so years, both of those things are changing. We now have a really good sense of the social determinants of health and the power of the built environment. And we also are getting really, really good at quantifying historically qualitative things. So I um, was lucky enough to be at MIT kind of thinking about these things and seeing the convergence of these factors. 
Um, and then I met my co-founder, uh, Jim Perino, who is a licensed architect. And he has, um, basically he experienced this exact same kind of challenge with not having data to create a business case for design um, while he was out in the field as a licensed architect. So we were lucky enough to meet in true MIT fashion across campus and people kind of brought us together because we were yelling about these themes from different mountaintops. Um, and as Carly mentioned, we not only went through Delta V, but we went through um, programs like uh, MIT Design X and different programs before that as well. So, um, you know, it was really kind of fortunate for me that I was able to take my personal passions of data and health and wellness, but also meet an amazing co-founder um, that had field experience in kind of what we're doing today. Um, so yeah, happy to, to pause there and then get into it, Carly. Thanks. Thanks, Sonal. Um, Quentin, would you like to go next? Everyone, thank you to, to, to all of you, Alberto, obviously, Andres, all the team at, at Q, and super excited to, to be back on the panel with Carly and, and Irene and, and Sonala as well. Uh, I'm Quentin. I'm from Belgium originally. Um, I started a business called Waffle. And the concept is really to say, how do you get rid of an industry that is incredibly boring, uh, that is probably the least sexy that you can imagine, insurance? And how do you address the gaps that the insurance has? Why is it so complicated to understand? Why is it that when you actually need it, you, you find yourself facing a series of exclusion that we would be called, oh, I'm so sorry, Carly, but you know we have an exclusion in your policy for pandemic. We cannot give you your money back. So we really started to think with my two co-founders, Michael and Sam, that, that uh, and like Sonal, I met them at, at MIT very early on in the program. And we started to think and, and we started to say, why is it that it's like Carly has to be the policy holder of a big insurance company? Why can you not get Carly insurance or like Sonal insurance or Alberto insurance? And that's effectively what we created. So we wanted to address not one specific pain point in the, in the industry, but all the pain points uh, at, the same time, at the same time, which we thought was really the exciting thing, right? And we do this uh, by partnering with some of the best people that we know in the industry, and we power our entire analysis by the sexy thing about us, which is the data analytics. We've, we've created the first holistic risk model uh, that basically allows us not to underwrite Carly the driver or Carly the homeowner, but Carly has a as an individual. So that's really what Waffle is all about. Uber personalized insurance to protect you, everything and everyone that you love in, in one place. Thanks, Quentin. And Irene. Irene, you are muted. Thank you, Carly, and, and thank you for having me, for inviting me to this session. I'm truly excited. Um, in my case, I started Gattaca um, back in at the beginning of 2017 and it was probably a combination of totally or apparently uncorrelated aspects of my life at the time so I got involved into blockchain technologies uh, very early on I um, uh, si since I was so interested in I pursued um, a job at the MIT Media Lab specifically at the DCI the department that researches on blockchain technologies I got acquainted with the technology from the technical perspective, very deep um, in, into the technical aspects. And at that time, I had been living in the US for over six years. And I was, I guess as a European citizen, a little bit overwhelmed about how personal data was managed um, and how much information was always required from me from totally uncorrelated um, um, uh, transactions. Um, and then uh, kind of the trigger was that I became a victim of the Equifax data breach, uh, where uh, over 300 million uh, data records were stolen, financial information, including mine. And that is when I started to look into why is it like, like there is a fundamental problem in the authentication architecture of the internet, where us users have to constantly give up on our private information over and over again without control. And this is only going to get worse because we're advocated towards a fully digital economy. So we need to change something. And this is, I guess, with my other experience in decentralized architectures where I came up with the theory that we should not just try to perform better 
um, authentication processes, we, we should fundamentally, fundamentally change the authentication architecture of the internet, um, literally to invert it. Instead of us creating isolated identities with each service provider we interact with, to have one single digital identity that we selectively share with any service provider worldwide. Um, so that was the genesis. I conducted an independent research study at MIT on the optimal architecture, technical architecture, using exploiting blockchain technologies to um, accomplish this goal. And that was the genesis of, of what today is Gattaca. Thanks, Irene. Um, so I'm curious, we have, I know that our audience today is a lot of folks who work at pretty big companies in a variety of industries, including ones that overlap with what, what you are all are working on. And so, Noel, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, you're introducing data into an industry that I assume is, you know, moving at a pretty, pretty fast pace, but I'm sure that, um, you know, number one, you're sort of bringing a whole new level of data and a whole new level of sort of understanding of, um, you know, how to make the spaces that we all live and work and, and play in, um, you know, more, more healthy, more efficient, obviously increasingly important. I'm sure your business has changed quite a bit and, and the reception that you get from customers has changed quite a bit over the last year. So I'm curious if you could sort of talk about, I know that we do have a lot of folks in the healthcare sector, and then I know that you're spending some time in office buildings too. And I'm sure we have a lot of people on the line who are either in charge and, and leaders in large organizations um, who have to bring back employees or perhaps uh, are, are employees themselves who may or may not be nervous about going into spaces. So can you talk about just sort of broadly you know, what's happened for, for Spatia over the last year um, and, you know, and, and what sort of, um, what kind of conversations are you having with potential customers? Are they welcoming conversations? Uh, has that sort of changed for you? I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, sure, Carly. Um, and yeah, just for, for the audience, a little bit of context. Um, we were always focused on, you know, providing data during the design process to really kind of help um, architects, owners, everyone in between, you know, in the real estate industry kind of make the best decisions with data in hand, not just to, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels on sustainability or building materials, um, but we were really focused on how do you get the highest ROI when it comes to human well-being and human operations within a building. And so, um, as Carly mentioned, we really got our start in healthcare facility design um, for a few different reasons. One, um, you know, our personal backgrounds in, in the health and well-being industry and Jim's background on designing hospitals for several years um, really kind of brought that level of expertise. And it was really funny that a lot of people, you know, Healthcare is such an ignored uh, industry in some ways because, especially in the real estate industry, um, Carly, you're you know you're talking about people uh, that are slow to take on data. We're at the intersection of real estate and healthcare, just to give you a sense of like the complexities, but also the the you know the slowness with which people are um, you know kind of open to data. I think that's changing very rapidly over the last year. But we were really kind of focused on how do we actually generate spatial data for a healthcare facility to help them understand what aspects of the space are actually driving or contributing or telling a story around health outcomes. Um, and in the case of healthcare, there's so much rich health outcome data and healthcare data, there's so little spatial data. And that's why a lot of these connections can't be made at scale because we, just, we don't have the data. Um, so, you know, we were kind of really focused single-handedly on, on the intersection of, of designing healthcare facilities in particular, and as Carly mentioned, you know, when COVID hit, um, of course, you know, hospitals were trying to double down and say, okay, how can I use space as an asset? Like, what do I need to do? How do I, you know, repurpose certain areas? How do I think about flexibility of space? How long-term is this? How short-term is this? So we, we were working with our customers to answer a lot of those questions, but ironically, a lot of the partners we were working with um, whether it was architecture firms or furniture OEMs came to us and said, look, we know that we've been working with you in a healthcare context, but you guys are really the only ones that are measuring or quantifying infection control or collaboration or exposure to something. Um, we've got to start doing this for office. So um, it was really quite incredible that we worked with our partners on a super short time frame to start to translate some of the metrics we had in the health and wellness space and specifically the healthcare space and actually translate that to a return to office diagnostic. So, um, you know, we've been working kind of in both constructs, but I think if anything, it's proven that even though our focus was really kind of matching the data in that kind of clinical setting, um, a lot of the metrics that we're doing absolutely affect not just kind of COVID specific return to office, but also how do you think about office spaces more generally? And 
the way that we're positioned is that it doesn't really matter if companies want to increase their square footage you know over time or decrease their square footage over time but if you're going to make a shift um, make sure that you have the data in hand to to really make sure that your space is working for you and not you kind of you know uh, constraining yourself to that space so yes absolutely we've seen a huge shift in, in the way people are thinking about the role of space of course but We've also seen our conversations really brought in from healthcare to, to real estate beyond. Yeah, very, very exciting opportunities for, for all of you. Um, and Quentin, I'm really curious when I think about Waffle, and this is sort of my perspective and feel free to, to, to correct it if it's a little bit off, but I think about you guys really changing the user experience for insurance, right? When you think about a lot of innovation, especially coming out of New York in particular, we think a lot about consumer products and really changing you know, the way that, that consumers buy products, the way that consumers, um, you know, have products that are very personalized for them, like, like Waffle is doing. So can you talk about, I'm just curious, I know that you've started to um, interact with potential customers. You just were able to, to launch, I think, the beta of Waffle. I'm curious what you're hearing, and I'm sure there's lots of lessons for everybody in, in the way that you guys are, um, you know, listening to consumers' needs and really changing the way that, that insurance is really looked at. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the reception that you're getting from customers and and um, what people are really excited about in the potential of Waffle? I think you said it right. right? Everything that you see now in the in the on the market is basically sort of a one size fits all, right? You, you put out your information, then you get a quote for a product, but you don't really know what that what that product is, right? Do you have like fine print that are forty pages long? Who the heck is going to read those things? I'm a lawyer. If I read this thing, I don't even get it, right? And and I started to learn about insurance quite a bit. Right? So it, it's incredibly complicated. So the way that we, we, we've done it, the premise was to say, I should empower Carly to be able to design what she needs, right? Uh, you may have needs that other people don't, and you may not care about certain uh, 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 coverage that, that most people would want to have, right? You, you, live in, you, you live in Brooklyn. You, you don't have like a... At 25 acres, not yet in Brooklyn, right? So you, you have different needs from the traditional homeowners that, that that you would see in most of the country. So what we've 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 started to do from the very beginning is to choose product that offers that offers the broadest possible coverage in the world, right? So you can cover almost anything to almost everything with the products that we have. But the one thing that frustrates uh, users, that's what we learn mostly from the, the feedback that we got from the beta users and everything that we did before, is the notion of, okay, you guys are asking me to pay for a product, but you're going to find a way in the fine print to screw me over when I actually have a problem, and I'm going to file a claim, and you're not going to give me my money. And that's a problem that was really, really recurring. So what we decided to do is to remove, to the extent possible, all the exclusions that you have in the policy. Right, so insurance actually comes through when you need it, and that's really the what Waffle is all about. We want to bring back the industry to what it's supposed to be. If you think about social security, all the public goods, it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, safety, a safety net, right? A real public safety net. But so is insurance. Insurance is a societal safety net, and we want to bring back insurance to that kind of role. So what do we do? With us, for instance, you can cancel a plane at any time for any reason, right? You, you don't have a listed numbers of conditions. You just choose. Let's say you wake up one morning, Carly wakes up and like, I can't stand Quentin. I just bought something from him on Waffle. I'm just going to cancel. You get your money back, right? The consumer should be at the center of the experience, not the product. And that's the main lesson that we got from our users is really make it about me. Don't make it about the products. Make it about what I need. Make sure that the fine print is not crazy. Make sure there is no overlap and get rid of as many exclusions as you, as you can. So that's really the big feedback we got. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting um, prospect. And, and like I mentioned, we've seen so many success stories in New York, whether it's you know consumer products like Warby Parker, the, the glasses maker, or Harry's, the shaving company. And I think being able to bring that that really consumer-focused lens to an enormous industries and, and really painful products like insurance is very exciting. Um, and so, Irene, to sort of try to pivot that to you also, I assume that, you know, you're in a space that I think everybody knows they need, right? Everybody knows that we're doing more and more online, especially over the last year. We've had a lot, like, really no choice. Even if you tried to still do things offline, it, it just wasn't possible. I think we're all using you know, digital payments more probably than we were a year ago and so forth. 
So I'm just curious for you, what has the reception been from the market? Who who have you had success with um, early in Gattaca's you know um, time? Like, what consumers are you working with? And and for all of the organizations on the line who probably think a lot about how to manage their their digital footprint or their customer digital footprint, you know, how do you sort of see um, your industry evolving and and Gattaca's market evolving? Sure. Um, so the first thing I perhaps should explain is that we're trying to build one single uh, digital identity for everyone, meaning you would be at the center in the control of all your digital footprint in one single place that you only control. And it's kind of providing read access to any service provider you want to interact with in order to authenticate yourself. That's kind of uh, the philosophy. Um, in this sense, we're not trying to substitute the role of identity providers, meaning, for instance, governments uh, for the issuance of government IDs or universities for the issuance of our academic diplomas. So the, the characteristic of our ecosystem is, is that it is a three-sided market. We have, on the one hand side, credential issuers, the ones that currently um, are authorities in their respective fields. We have the end consumers, and then we have service providers that want to authenticate these users, clients, employees, um, anyone really remotely in order to perform any transaction. Um, so I was wrong at the beginning. I thought this industry was going to be pushed by the private sector. Um, and my guess uh, was at the time, uh, we did a lot of PMR, primary market research with financial institutions, thinking that, okay, we, we could save a lot of money um, and, you know, headache during onboarding processes in the financial industry. Right now, if you want to create a new bank account um, in a new financial institution, either you have to go in person or have a very cumbersome digital onboarding process that then costs a lot of money to those financial institutions to verify. So why not, instead of doing this KYC, this identity verification every single time from scratch in its digital service, we just do it once on the user side and we share that KYC, so to speak. Um, but I was wrong. Uh, the governments, uh, which I thought would be the last in adopting this um, um, architecture and paradigm, are the ones pushing um, uh, their respective industries into adopting self-sovereign identity, which is how, how you know, my, my technology is called um, in the industry. It is actually regulators uh, adapting their current legislation and regulations in order to make decentralized identities or self-sovereign identities um, uh, of legal value. So they're legally uh, binding and valid in order to perform transactions that require this uh, legal framework. Um, so our first customers are surprisingly governments, um, the ones that we need the most, on the other hand, because once you provide a legally valid digital identity that you can reuse in the private sector, then the potential becomes um, unlimited, really. Um, so our first customers are definitely the public sector, but also uh, universities. Um, one of the first use cases for self-sovereign identity is the issuance of academic diplomas and student IDs in an interoperable way. Um, so um, there can be interoperability between academic institutions worldwide. That's great. And um, Alberto, I'll just sort of check in because I know we're about 20 minutes out. So if we have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, but maybe just before we jump into audience questions, maybe while Alberto's getting those queued up, Irene, I'd love to ask you and then um, Sonal and Quentin, feel free to jump in. But, um, you know, you've been building this business across, you know, between Boston and Madrid. We have lots of folks um, in the audience who are familiar probably with the Madrid ecosystem and, and perhaps wondering about the Boston ecosystem. Has location influenced you, you know, in, in the business that you're building? Has it been material? And what would you sort of say are the differences for you in the two ecosystems that you've been building Gattaca in? Um, definitely location has made a huge difference for me. Um, uh, 
positive and negative influence, I would say, in, in either ecosystem. So from the business perspective, being in Europe has helped me a lot because I'm dealing with uh, GDPR. The European Commission is the one most advanced in terms of regulating SSI in the world. Um, so being here locally and being able to have direct conversation with European governments um, has definitely been um, um, very positive for my business. Uh, for, for the startup, um, as a generic business, um, I guess um, I, I would have benefited more from having stayed in Boston. Um, especially, I would say two things. First, obviously, there is much more um, funding in the U.S. than in Spain. Definitely, I mean, no question. Um, Spain has um, grown a lot. Though the ecosystem has grown incredibly fast, but there's still a long way to go until we can reach those levels. And there is a second thing that is very important, and I find it missing from from this ecosystem uh, in comparison with the Boston ecosystem, and is the connection between universities and startups. So here in Spain, startups are built from professionals that want to now become entrepreneurs. Um, and in Boston, I see more and more startups coming out of universities. It's kind of that they grow up in the university and then they become a business and they go out to the world. And there's still this link, you know, startups can benefit from a pool of talent and resources from universities that then, um, you know, feed those startups. Uh, that connection, uh, I'm not finding it that strong here and it's very much needed. Yeah, that's interesting. I would say a similar observation about New York. We have wonderful universities here in New York, but um, they're much less linked. I don't know if Quentin, you would disagree, but in my opinion, a lot less linked to the startup ecosystem than in Boston, which to me is really an education-driven, university-driven ecosystem. Quentin, we can't hear you, I don't think. But maybe, Alberto, any questions while Quentin's fixing his sound? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Sorry. Yeah. Freaking AirPods. It never works. Uh, so, listen. Yeah, there are, uh, there are some, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are some, some questions in the chat. And I am I'm curious about some things. Sure. First of all, Bill, Bill is connected. And he was saying to me that I speak another language that is American. So, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Will, for your support with my language and my English. So, and th there are some questions in the chat, and there are other questions that I would like to, to throw, Carly, if you don't mind. Please. For this last, last part of the conversation. Um, well, first of all, for, for Quentin, well, just one comment, Quentin. Here at the Cube Madrid, we have an innovation center on insurance build up by a, by a national insurance company. So we are more, more than glad to, to explore with you some opportunities here, if you are not here, uh, in Spain, I mean. And, and I was thinking about this, this last part Irene was saying about in, in Spain or in Europe, startups are made up by professionals, and this is completely true. And when you go to the States, you have a lot of a lot of infrastructure coming from universities in order to, to really foster people to go for their dreams and to, to create these startups in deep tech or in digital technologies or whatever. But um, if I read some statistics, and this is a question for, for you all, I see that the, the probability of being successful with your business in, is increasingly higher, is, is, is bigger when you are 40, 45, or even 50, right? So, so I guess that all these new startups coming from university um, are a way, of, a way of learning or probably a way of or really being in contact with the, the real world, right? Because the probability of success is, is, is different for those that they have all these senior entrepreneurs or flavor entrepreneurs. What do you think about this? Sorry, is, it, is this for me? Well, 
for, for you all. So you can you can answer Quentin if you want. Oh sure. So listen, um, yeah, I've gr I, I, I grew up in Europe, right? Uh, so and I'm I'm very familiar with Spain as well, having been there like 25 times or so, right? I think I think Irene is absolutely right. There is a big disconnect in the way that uh, business and R and D and innovation is conducted. I think Carly is absolutely right. It doesn't mean that the U.S. is a one time one size fits all. Boston is incredibly uh, involved in its startup. So is uh, Stanford, right? So is Penn. But New York is a bit more in in retreat. There is there is no doubt about it. I think um, I think it's priceless to have the support of your university. And I would encourage anyone that gets into the innovation, whether you're in Europe, in the Middle East, in Australia, in Asia to get involved as soon as you can with your university. While Alberto is absolutely right on the success rate, why are we usually more successful when you're older and you've done all the mistakes that you need to make? You need to start making the mistakes as early as you can. And univer the university uh, ecosystem and the innovation labs and, and everything that is even not-for-profit incubators are really helping you to make those mistakes and to start your first business. That's really how you learn. And that's also why after making two or three uh, uh, big uh, uh, moves, and even if you fail one or two of them, you can you can get to that 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 bigger that bigger shot. So there is no doubt in my mind that, uh, and again, really talking as an European here, um, I have benefited much more from uh, the Boston ecosystem than I would have from a, a European ecosystem. Uh, no doubt in my mind. I, it's very nice your point because it's true that. Probability of success is even really remote, even if you are younger or if you are older. So the, the possibility of, of committing mistakes very soon and uh, fix these mistakes very soon is is really interesting. And I have a question for Sonal also, because we talk in, in previous radical sessions about the concept. Bill was telling us about the concept of anti-fragility. Okay, anti-fragile. So, and this is a characteristic that probably in startups is, is really one of our key characteristics. And how did you deal with this COVID-19 situation? Because you are talking about data that you are processing, and this is completely a black swan for you and for your business, right? How did you deal with this? Yeah, it's a great question. I love how Irene framed, you know, like the, the things you learned, Irene, from, from your hypothesis and how that was different. I think we've had that got multiple times over at this point. And I think, you know, the first the first wave, this is still pre-COVID, but it was manifesting itself as, as COVID was spreading, um, at least in the US, is we our first hypothesis is that we wanted to work directly with owners. So if you're a health system, you know, working with um, the head of facilities for the health system. If you're a corporation, working with the head of facilities for office spaces. And what we found is that, well, we were wrong because at the end of the day, those guys, while they're, well, they have hundreds of millions of dollars in budget and they constantly are iterating and master planning how to iterate on their spaces, they're really looking to the architects to, to do that, right? And so they're, they're hiring an architect with the assumption that architects have these data tools in place. So we realized very quickly that we were kind of talking to the wrong person in the ecosystem early on. And so we then started to shift the conversation and actually talk to architects directly and say, hey, we know we've worked with your, you know, your customer. We actually think that we can make your life a lot easier. And what we found is that architects were willing to lose money and do all of this data analysis manually just to make the case and just to create these landmark projects for their brand. So we were already wrong. We're kind of in the middle of a, a shift to, you know, talking to, you know, owners to then architects. And, and the reason I, I create that as context is because when COVID happened, you know, obviously healthcare was in shambles, right? So we already knew that our immediate focus of healthcare was, was, was down, you know, we didn't know which direction it would go, but we knew that there was a lot of chaos. The other aspect to consider is as we started shifting our business to architects, there were, at least in the US, construction was completely halted. So as a result, architects have suddenly lost their entire pipeline of projects in terms of their, their line of work. So if there's no projects happening, that means there's no new projects coming in and everything was put on pause. And so I think for us, 
you know, a, a very much a student of Bill's anti-fragile mentality. And I think the biggest thing that we've learned is just, you know, pick up the phone, pick up the phone and ask people what's going on, how are they feeling, what do they need? And I think that's really what helped us you know, one shift from, from working directly with the owners to architects, but also helped us in the architecture industry really understand like, how are you doing? How are you coping? Are you doing layoff? And so we had a lot of people whose email addresses just stopped working. So I think the most, of course, it, it meant a lot of you know um, struggle for us as a startup. You know, we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know what would happen to the art healthcare industry. We didn't know what would happen to the architecture industry. But we just kept picking up the phone and we kept calling and said, "Look, tell us what's going on. Like, are you?" okay like are you guys still what is the what is it looking like and we actually realized that by labor day of last year um things were starting to recover but people were in a very different place and so a lot of the architecture firms we were working with actually had to furlough or let go a number of people but they still had the responsibility of doing all of these analytics. So, really okay. um, so yeah happy happy to talk more about it or, or offline connect with anyone kind of going through that or, or unsure about how it depends on their idea or their business but the biggest thing we learned is just you know keep the conversation going at all costs. Nice. I have I have an, one last question for Irene. Okay, Irene. Um, there are um, some questions for you, but um, as as now I I've heard that you are in Madrid right now. We will we will have the possibility to to send it to you. But I I have um, a question for you regarding Europe regarding uh, our legislation as you know perfectly uh, in the US everything is permitted until it's forbidden and here in Europe it's all over the other way it, everything is forbidden until it's permitted how do you deal with these new policies all our laws um, GDPR um, all, all this regulation will affect you is good for your business or on the contrary is bad for your business it is, it is great for my business, I have to say. GDPR is exactly saying that the owner of data is the user, not the service provider that holds it. Um, so in that, in that sense, the European legislation already provided a very nice framework for um, our technology to thrive. Um, yet there were a lot of challenges um, to me. For instance, our approach to online authentication was radically new and therefore was not included and contemplated in current KYC legislation and we uh, for instance EIDAS is the uh, European legislation for electronic identification uh, this type of architecture is not was not and is not yet approved um, but one thing I, I learned as part of this um, you know anti-fragile anti um, mindset is that uh, okay yeah that that part of the legislation is not there yet uh, but why are not we the ones proposing to change it? Why can't we, even if we are a small startup, be one of the leaders pushing for a change in legislation? Um, sounds super ambitious, sounds difficult, it is, um, but it's possible, it's doable. Um, and that's uh, where things started moving. Obviously, not, not just us. There is a whole ecosystem um, trying to push with us towards this goal. Um, but it's possible, and that's what we're doing. So it, it has definitely helped. And whatever doesn't fit yet, try to change it. Perfect. Thank you, Irene. And um, well, a big, a big thank you for you, Carly. To, to manage all this conversation, to really take this best of breed uh, entrepreneurs here with, with us, and and to expose uh, these startups to the to the Spanish community. And thank you really very much because Quentin, Sonal, Irene, you, you did it great. We we learn a lot. We invite you to come here whenever it's possible to visit us personally, and and stay. Stay tuned, stay tuned because this is the end of our fourth session. And as Andres was saying from, from Cadiz, we, we are preparing all these new things. A big thank you also for the Cube team because they are producing these events without any professional help. So we are producing this on our own, as you know, as good startups. And 
follow us in our social networks. We are hanging everything in LinkedIn, so you can you can see all this in our Radical Session newsletter. For the Spaniards, you can follow us in our uh, the Cube newsletter in our web page. And, and a big thank you, Carly, and a big thank you also to Bill that he has been um, chatting around the around the all these um, all these sessions. And Quentin, Sonal, and Irene, thank you, thank you very much, and hope to see you soon in person. Thanks, Roberto. Thank Hopefully, thank you. thank you. Okay, as you know, that 60% of Fortune 500 companies were created during a crisis. So my desire, my belief is that some of your companies or most of your companies of your startups and of your dreams will come up in this Fortune 500 list soon, okay? Very soon. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, from Spain. Bye -bye.